edges where, where it curves in, it's really smooth. So it looks like it's all flowing. That's really cool. It kind of looks like when you make your hands into the doves. It looks kind of human-like, just like a mother bending over to pick up a baby or something. The artist who made these mysterious, sensual sculptures has been tempting people to reach out and touch for more than 50 years. I don't know why, but I really want to hug it. Why do you want to hug it? I don't know, it just sort of gives you that inviting feeling. Like, you can also, you can just snuggle your face in it. And it's just <laughs> like... Ah. A lot of art you walk up to and it's, you know, it's the object, you're the person. Seeing her work, you almost have the feeling you're meeting something that has uh, a life to it. Her inspiration for these metal and stone incarnations comes from her dreams. I almost lose sensibility or consciousness and gradually something transfers from my psyche, my emotions, my vision into that clay. The results, small and large, can be seen all over the world, in museums, parks, and city centers. There are also plenty of people who want one of their own. We have an incredible demand, and everybody wants to see the newest work that's coming out. As an art dealer, I need her to carve faster. Um. <laughs> In an art world obsessed with the purely conceptual, she has followed her own path, working in the hardest of traditional materials, pushing them to their limits in an unashamed pursuit of beauty. When marble is carved so thin that it might break on a five meter sculpture, you're in incredibly risky territory. But she will take that risk because she's absolutely convinced that that beauty is worth fighting for. This film reveals the story of one of Britain's greatest living sculptors, Helene Blumenfeld. Over the period of a year, we follow her as she creates her most challenging work to date, The Tree of Life. Sculptor Helene Blumenfeld is preparing to embark on a major new work. But first, she needs to finish this one. This is Fortuna, a towering five meters high. The sculpture's been in the process for more than a year, and 16 people have been working on it. And it's a huge, it's a, a, the largest piece I've ever done. E questo è tutto qui in Postano. Today, Blumenfeld has come to inspect the finish, or patina, that has just been applied to the surface of Fortuna. Normally, the patina is quite heavy and it covers up all the blemishes. It's like makeup. So the thicker the makeup, the less you see what's going on underneath. But this sculpture has been given the lightest touch so that it looks amazing, it looks real, it's, it's, it's living. Blumenfeld traces her fascination with mysterious organic forms back to her early childhood. 
I think the first sculptures I saw in my dreams, and I actually dreamt form, I dreamt objects. Dreams would be amazing. And everyone would look at me as though, you know, I was just out of it. And I kept thinking, if I get a few more words, I, I begin to be more poetic in describing what I'm, what I'm seeing. But it took me a very long time to realize that you can't really describe something which is basically three-dimensional and mysterious with words. So maybe this whole process which I've gone through of learning to carve, learning to create forms, comes from those early visions. I called them visions rather than dreams because they were so clear and they would stay with me. Blumenfeld has spent most of her life translating these visions into physical form and often on a giant scale. These days, she's a little less hands-on than she used to be, but she's still heavily involved in this immensely physical and demanding process. Sculpture is traditionally seen as sort of a man's medium, but particularly if you're working at scale. It's heavy, it's dirty, it's, um, you know, hard work. And you don't survive in that world unless you've really got a strong will and a strong character and a strong sense and confidence that what you can produce will be meaningful to other people. Blumenfeld makes almost all of her sculpture in Italy, but she lives in the UK, and her latest commission is for her hometown of Cambridge. The sculpture will be sited at the heart of a major new international education center. So it's been a while yeah, since you were here at last. It looks amazing. It's October 2016, and Blumenfeld has come to see how the building works are progressing and to make a final decision as to where the sculpture will be located. So this would lead out to there where... That's right, so there's going to be a path that this goes this whole in. area would it'd be beautiful. Yeah. Ed Kessler is the founder and director of this place, the Wolf Institute, a pioneering centre for scholarship established to encourage interfaith dialogue between Jews, Muslims and Christians. I want people to see this sculpture, to think and reflect when they walk past it. Some might sit down mm -hmm. and some might go straight to class. In fact, mm -hmm. if they're late, they might be running to class. Mm -hmm. um, but it will be the focal point of the campus. And we talked about having that yeah. circular plinth. Yeah, and we could even have a two layer circles that people could sit on it. Yes, but absolutely. Yeah. I think once the building's up, we'll have a better sense, yes. won't we, of exactly yes. how, where, exactly where it will be located and how we present it. There are many unanswered questions about the form the sculpture will take. But Helene has already decided that this new work will be made in marble. Her process begins with a visit to a mountain. This is a marble quarry, cut deep into the flank of Mount Altissimo, which towers nearly five and a half thousand feet up in Tuscany's Apuan Alps. Altissimo marble was made famous by none other than Michelangelo. He was the first of many sculptors to come here in search of the perfect stone. This is the highest point of any of the quarries. That's why it's called Altissimo. It means the highest. I'm sure you can see it, this enormous drop. I'm not afraid of heights, but I don't trust myself to move. <laughs> I 
Altissimo has the finest marble in all of, of the world, really, in terms of purity, in terms of the crystals and the crystal quality. What's incredible in this particular quarry is you have everything. You have the piece I'm holding and touching here, which is called Venato, which has a pattern in it. You have along the periphery there, the only marble I really like to use for smaller pieces, which is called Statuario, which is the quality of marble the Greeks used for their most beautiful statues, and which is translucent. For me, it means inspiration, it means beauty, it means serenity. It's just, I don't come to choose the marble, I just come to be romanced by the marble, inspired by the marble again and again. For Blumenfeld, this moment of peace on the mountain is a rare break. To deliver the Tree of Life on time, she now needs to discover the form she is going to sculpt. This is Blumenfeld's studio in Pietrasanta, where most of her sculpture first finds its shape. The clay models or maquettes, which line the shelves in their hundreds, are the starting point for all of her work. The forms they represent come to her in the night. I mean, I dream the whole form sometimes. Then when I go to the clay, I, I don't know if I remember the dream, but I begin to feel it coming back again. I do manage to lose sense of time and place. And I would say that I almost lose sensibility or consciousness. Her work is infinitely recognisable as Helene. And I think it's because she goes back to an inner life. The way that each one starts as an individual encounter between her and her materials in the studio, in a kind of private space. I think it's a slow process of translating what you feel, what you think, what you've seen, what you've understood, what you've suffered even. And Gradually, something transfers from my psyche, my emotions, my vision into that clay. And what are you feeling? Happy. <laughs> Sometimes happy. Mostly, mostly Pete, that really, it's a wonderful feeling. So we should have a look. <laughs> Today, Blumenfeld is visiting her plaster studio to work on one of the clay models she has recently upscaled. She has decided that this will be the Tree of Life, her new commission in Cambridge. I always start with a small maquette to capture the moment, capture the spontaneity, capture the excitement of an idea. But if I'm going to do something three meters, four meters, five meters, I have to be thinking about what will happen when it is that size, when it's really big, when people are looking at it from below. So for that reason, I almost always do another model. And this is the, the model which I've done because I'm going to be then taking this to do it translated in marble. And here, the whole thing is lifting up. It's much more active, it's much more movement, it's more elegant. 
I've added about this much again to that, and I've added to the top. So it's going into the sky. So look at that, that's like a angel thrust, forms, trees, branches, leaves, opening up, welcoming. Blumenfeld has evolved her approach and skill as a sculptor over more than five decades. <laughs> when I work, <laughs> I understand why this finger, look at the difference between those two fingers, <laughs> because this is doing so much work all the time. Her journey as a sculptor began in her early 20s in the city of Paris. This is the Academy of La Grande Chaumière, an art school where some of the biggest names in sculpture, such as Juan Miro, Alberto Giacometti, and Alexander Calder, honed their craft. Today, Helene has returned to the studio where she began her artistic education back in 1962. It was very scary because, first, I didn't speak French. Secondly, I didn't speak the language of sculpture. I didn't, I didn't know. I had no art history. I was like completely innocent in this world. They had six guys naked parading up along for us to choose one. And they were all ages. They were fat, they were thin, hairy. I just thought, I don't know, this is, I, 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 mean, my, I was pretty sophisticated, or I thought I was, but I never, ever had anything like that. Anyway, I just took my clay and I moved it around a bit, and as a professor looked at my work, he just looked in total disdain. But despite the professor's lack of approval, not everyone took against Helene's early work. One of the artists associated with the Academy was the great Russian sculptor Osip Zadkin. Zadkin picked out Blumenfeld's work from amongst the other students and asked to meet her. This is Zedkin's house, now the Zedkin Museum, run by curator Veronique Gautarin. It was here that Helene did her apprenticeship as a sculptor. Do you remember if uh, at uh, the end of each day you covered uh, yes. oh, sure, the, the clay, clay with a uh, humid uh, yes. a piece yes. of uh, yes. cloth? Yes. yes, yes. Did you do that? Oh, yes, of course. That was a ritual. Always. Zadkin, one of the giants of the 20th century, forged his own distinctive path as a sculptor, influenced as much by Greek and African carving as modernism. He proved an idiosyncratic teacher. His hope was that you don't look at the anatomy of the sculpture. You don't look at the detail of it. You look at the spirit of it. And that you open yourself up when you're looking so that it affects you. It's like a revelation. You looked at a sculpture and you were transported somewhere else, that it moved you. He never really taught me anything in that way of teaching do this, do this. But he, he told me so much about what it is to be an artist. You learned what it was. 
emotionally and to give yourself over to being a sculptor, to having your whole life be that. And that was, you know, something nobody else could have taught me. It's a cold morning in March, and Blumenfeld is back in Italy. She's visiting one of the big marble dealers in Pietrasanta to choose a block. She's hoping she can find one large enough to accommodate the sculpture she has in mind. The piece, as you know, is going to be more or less that shape. Yeah, out of, the, yeah. out of the side. Okay. Yeah. On this side, that we, oh, yeah. we can see the, yeah. the side in the light. She's accompanied by Leonardo Baratti, a marble artisan with whom she's worked for over 20 years. Each giant oblong has its own patterning and character. And for the Tree of Life, they're hoping to find a block with only the subtlest markings set in a pure white stone. See, now that looks beautiful. I would have asked one like that. Too much gray. So that's so beautiful, my God. It is so, so. And it's, it's very uh, crystal, too. Look at this side. Fantastic. This could be the right one, but first they need to check for fault lines in the stone. Potential cracks that could prove disastrous. Okay, there are no defects, only just this one. On this corner, going away. Yeah, it wouldn't no, bother anyone. No, so the remaining part of the block is pure. Fantastic. With no cracks, pristine. The block looks good. And after much debate, Helene and the team decide to commit to this 42-ton piece of marble. Central to Blumenfeld's success is her ability to transform this raw material into strange, luminous, almost weightless forms. People are drawn in by the craft the fact that they can see how extraordinary the work is. People will come into the gallery and say, from outside, I thought this was ceramics. I've come in and I can't believe these have all been carved from a solid piece of marble. So there's that very human reaction to delighting in being surprised and like a magic trick that they can't, how, how is this done? But it's not just the technical achievement that makes people stop and wonder. It's unlike, frankly, what anyone else is doing these days. To the first time viewer, they might think this is a, just an abstract form. And it's hard to define what they are that organic forms almost otherworldly. They're ethereal. They're not trying to be a particular um, figure or even type of being. It's much more giving form to spirit, giving form to emotion, giving form to a feeling that you have in a way that has a real aesthetic presence. You can look at it and you feel joyous, or you can look at it and you feel anguished, but it's how you perceive it. Each person brings to it their perceptions. There is no wrong way, because if you bring yourself to it and look at it and feel it, that's the right way.
It's now summer, and the initial carving, or roughing out, of the Tree of Life is well underway. Using traditional calipers, the artisans are carefully upscaling the plaster model into stone. Out of the giant block, a shape is beginning to emerge. It's a beautiful marvel. It's such a pure marvel and very, very hard, which means working it is very hard. Pierangelo Vieni because I have worked with these, these two guys for so many years and so many projects, and they know my work so well. And you see what hard work it is, exhausting. And, and I, I, said, <laughs> I said, you know, are you going to go on with this? Yeah, because that's the joy of working in the marble. It's a romantic idea, but it's also very fulfilling. As you see it, the form emerging, Blumenfeld first began making sculpture here in Pietrasanta in the 1970s. Pietrasanta was incredibly seductive. You were in a place where everybody was working in marble. There was such a sense of um, possibility and, and acceptance. The workers, the marble workers, you know, they use the pneumatic tool, which makes a noise. But on top of this noise, you could hear them singing. It, it was a tradition. And so you would walk up and down the streets and you would hear of the pneumatic tool and on top singing. Here in Pietrasanta, Helene met Sem Gallardini, a hugely influential marble studio owner who worked with numerous contemporary sculptors, including Henry Moore. Sem recognized Blumenfeld's talent and welcomed her enthusiasm to learn the traditional carving skills. There used to be, for every single uh, aspect of carving a figure, there would be a different artisan. So someone would do the hand, someone would do the arm, and someone else would do the neck. There'd always be someone else who did the hair. So Sam's idea was that I should go and sort of apprentice with some of these old men, because these people were not going to exist very long, because that way of dealing with marble was, was vanishing. You learn a res tremendous respect for marble, that it can't be rushed. Working with the marble and bronze artisans in Pietrasanta, Blumenfeld began to build an international reputation and career. But it was a career that came at a price. Working in Italy, meant regularly leaving her husband, Yorick, and two young sons behind in England. This one's so cool. The pattern is incredible. I love how warm it is from the sun's rays. It looks so great here, too. So this piece is actually very autobiographical. It's a piece that is meant to be my mother, supported by our father. So is he the base? Or that? This is, so this figure here is Yorick. Hmm. 
and he is allowing Helene here hmm. to fly. Very cool. I never knew that. I think it was hard for Yorick because I'd ask him, oh, where's mommy? Oh, she went to Italy. Oh, when? Last night late. Well, when, when will she be home? Oh, I think in a week. And what'd she do? Do you remember? She would just leave. She yeah. would never tell us she no. was going. They were wondering, you know, when is she going to go? Uh, is she going to go tomorrow or the next day or the day after? Because she just didn't reveal it to, to them or even to me. <laughs> and so it was, it was uh, because she, she didn't want to face the fact that she was going. And she wanted to enjoy every minute that she was here. It was a somewhat difficult time. Those first years in Pietra Santa were very difficult. I think that was the real, almost, breaking point in our marriage. We were hostile to each other. Yorick hated be, being there and only sort of having to look after the children while I was working. It just made me feel, well, this is not a place where my children should come and my husband should come because this is where I've got to be working. When I was 45, I, that was the first time that I went to Pietra Santa. You'd never been? No. Your whole life? Yeah, I felt like it was forbidden. For me, Pietra Santa was a no man's land. I, I wasn't ever allowed to go there. I didn't really understand what happened there. I did go a couple of times, but uh, only at the very beginning. And I think mm. she did carve out that space to be the space where she worked. And so it was like her office, you know? Yeah. So, she didn't want any of us to come. And she did have a different life there, a different persona. She became Eleanor. Eleanor, <laughs> Eleanor. yeah. I hated that. In those days, nobody had cell phones and no one had telephones. So I was really incommunicado. I was very much isolated from my family. And it was very hard. <laughs> <laughs> and I think that that sense of guilt of not being there, not being with my husband, not being with my children, I think that led to a huge commitment. I mean, other people would go weekends and <laughs> go see shows, and I just worked. I felt that was what I was there for, and I worked all the time. Two people in any relationship if they turn too much into... The struggle between her identity as a mother and wife and her identity as an artist gave rise to one of the most potent themes in her work, a topic explored in a 1978 TV documentary. This one is the first sculpture where I detached the pieces, so they're the two pieces, and I, d I detached it because I felt it was symbolic. I wanted to show these two forms united, the female very dependent on the male, rather submissive, joined on the bottom, and the other side of a woman, I call this two sides of a woman, which has her own axis, which is independent, which can stand apart from, from the male figure, and can, by moving its position, change the way you, you, you see the basic two. Well, then I moved from the simple, linear figures to this group of figures where I was trying really to do two things, to use an abstract form and to, to convey emotion through the way the form was seated, still using the figure. So the far, the Two Sides of a Woman is a theme that has preoccupied Helene from the moment she began to do sculpture. This Two Sides of a Woman from 2016 is uh, an incredible piece. It's one of the greatest pieces I think that she's ever done. It's an iconic sculpture. But you understand that so much more 
if you understand the history behind it and where she's coming from. And for that, we have to go back to 1966 to one of this very, very early bronze, which was the first expression, really, of that idea. You have, on this side, the female form on her own, turning in on herself. You've got her arm, her head, her breast. But it's very much an internalization of those emotions. Turn the sculpture around, you see the other side. You see two figures in relief, the convex, the concave shapes. And brought together within that sculpture is a very, very physical, tangible idea of the conflicts that a female artist or a woman in general, particularly in the 60s and 70s, would feel in her own life, those two different sides of her personality, and whether they can ever be brought into balance. I mean, that's beautifully expressed in the form of that sculpture. It's July, and work starts early at the marble studio with the arrival of a crane. They're preparing now to lift the piece up. And it's very nerve-wracking because although we've prepared the model and we found out how we think we can lift this without damage, we won't know until we lift it. So that's very nerve-wracking. After four months of carving, the basic form has been roughed out. But before the work can go any further, the sculpture needs to be lifted upright and placed on its base. Getting the sculpture off the ground is relatively straightforward, but it's the next stage that's critical. Now it's a very complex manoeuvre. We have to get it standing up. So that will be a process of putting blocks under it to lift it gradually at a slight angle, re-strap it, move it again. Yeah, each time it's trial and error. The team are anxious about the extreme pressure being exerted on the wings of the sculpture. And a second crane is summoned to help take the strain. For Blumenfeld, this is a nail-biting moment. One slip of a strap could destroy six months of highly skilled workmanship. Finally, the sculpture is upright. Now it's simply a case of lowering five tons of swaying rock onto two narrow steel pins. Okay. Wow. Okay. Incredible. Incredible. See, see, okay. incredible. It's been a long movement, by the way. See, that's it. been incredible. It looks a strange thing, but you know it's yeah. normal with your work, such a movement. Yeah, with such my work, thing. I know. Now we can get rid of the crane so you can take yeah. a little walk around. It's and you did you it perfect for lunch? <laughs> Blumenfeld has now been making work in Pietra Santa for more than 45 years. And today, she's more prolific and more in demand than ever. Throughout her career, she's had one guiding principle, 
a determination not to repeat herself. You know, many artists have successful early, mid careers, but there comes a point when they're no longer the new thing. They don't always look as exciting as what is coming behind them. But Helene has managed to avoid that pitfall, if you like, by continuing to evolve in her artistry and in what she's creating. And it's bigger and more ambitious and more sort of complex than it's ever been before. My experience of Helene is that she's consistently looking for new boundaries, new limits, um, experimenting with things that she hasn't done before and that nobody else has done before. Today, sculptor Helene Blumenfeld is at London's Victoria and Albert Museum. She's here to witness the installation of one of her more unusual pieces of work in this national collection. It's heading for a spot on the wall of the V&A's spectacular jewellery gallery. This one-off, solid silver piece was made by Blumenfeld in the late 1970s. Oh, it's amazing. The way it's floating, it's wonderful. Claire Phillips is the jewellery curator. I think initially I was very struck by how abstract the form was, but as soon as you start to study it and to handle it, it, it the female form is, is there yes, as, as powerfully as in any of your larger pieces. What, what started you with making jewellery? Why did well, you switch? Well, what started me making jewellery was that uh, I had a dream one night that I was wearing a sculpt actual sculpture of mine around <laughs> my neck. I was walking like this, it was so heavy. <laughs> and I woke up and I said, that's, that's telling me something, I should make my own jewellery. Well, I still see it as sculpture more than, than simply jewellery. Mm. I don't want my jewellery to be decorative. Decorative is empty. And, and so if this was only decorative, I wouldn't feel pleased wearing it. I want mm. you to look at a piece of, that I've made and have a lot of different emotions about it and different reactions and not just say, oh, that's pretty. I mean, to me, this is the most beautiful gallery of any kind in the world. I mean, it's just incredibly beautiful. To feel, you know, a piece of mine is in, I'm very honored. It's early October, and work on the Tree of Life is entering a critical phase. Helene and Leonardo are preparing for the fine carving, and some important decisions need to be made. We wanted to leave marble here just to have a, like a joint between this one and this shape, or do you want it as it is now? Because it's a, in a big scale, you can see it there. You see this hump? Yeah, it's too it's much. It's quite strange. Hump. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. No, that's true. There, it looks very funny. No, I agree with you. So we have to connect it with yeah. something uh, around, or connect it with this or with that. Now we get the marble there to play with it and make it. Or we even shape. eliminate it. Or eliminate it, yeah. Yeah, I, I think, think we eliminate it. This is really important to get the. Helene's always pushing at the edge of what is possible from working in marble to carving marble to its finest point, to the point it might actually break. And I think Helene's prepared to sacrifice a work um, that isn't up to her vision of what a sculpture can be, how at the edge it can be, how beautiful it can be, how high it can be, how far it can reach. Over the coming weeks and months, this rough shape will be chiselled, sanded and polished to achieve the trademark Blumenfeld finish. 
Helene believes passionately in the importance of beauty. It's a priority in some ways at odds with the mainstream of contemporary art. Helene's work has been all about beauty. In an, in a, and at times that's of course been an unfashionable thing to say in an unfashionable way to make sculpture, but it's got a very noble tradition going back thousands of years. And it's not as if beauty has come to an end or should come to an end. We just find different ways or artists find different ways to express it. I mean, I've never felt really as though my goal was to be part of the art world as such. They're spiritual, I think. I mean, I'm, I am trying to show that there's something more to life. There is another dimension. There is something to hope for. There's something to move upwards for. There's an ascent. In 2013, a major retrospective of Blumenfeld's work was exhibited at Salisbury Cathedral. Cathedrals are places where you have to ask questions, big questions, and ask questions of yourself. And I suppose that's what Helene's work is really all about, because it is difficult to read. The response was that people found themselves stretched in what they were seeing. And funnily enough, if you stretch people, they then appreciate something more. Once you've spent a lot of time looking at it and reflecting on it, it, it speaks to you. I think being vocal about the spirit is very interesting and also very counter-fashionable and quite brave, actually. But I think that's what really reaches out to people. And I think that's what makes it powerful work. It's 6 a.m. on a chilly morning in late January. After a year of work in the marble studio in Pietra Santa, the completed sculpture has finally arrived in the UK at a transport depot outside Cambridge. It's being transferred onto a smaller truck for delivery to its final destination. Jimmy McKenzie is the man in charge. This manoeuvre is difficult, to say the least, because as they come up, they're nice and chunky at the bottom, and as they come up, they're always very, very delicate, sometimes going into millimetre carvings. Any damage to the sculpture has to be reworked, so there is no room for error at all. Installing this fragile, five-ton object into the center of the Wolf Institute is no mean feat. A 35-meter crane lifts the sculpture inside the college. Oh, I can just see a bit of marble. Yes, there. there it is. Before a specially imported super forklift edges the work into position. Absolutely the plan, much better than I thought. We so far haven't had any problems and there could have been so many. Mm -hmm. 
Despite being in her late 70s, Helene maintains a relentless enthusiasm for these challenging, large-scale projects. Like any serious artist, you've got to make the art that you feel you have it in you to make. And she's done that, and it's in a consistent way that's built a body of work which really does have a distinctive character, aesthetically, emotionally. And I think you can't really mistake it for any other artist's work. Even without knowing what the titles are, I think you get a sense that there's life, there's energy, there's emotion in these things. That's, I think, the constant. But then from work to work, of course, she does it in different ways. Some are quite quiet and contemplative. Others are much more dynamic. Others look like they're about to fly through the air and be blown up into the sky. They create all sorts of, if you like, little fantasies about what they are in the viewer. I think that's part of the magic of them. You can't help thinking, what is this thing? Is it alive? What sort of life does it have? What sort of spirit does it have? I think that's part of what she wants you to feel. Three, two, two one. one. Finally, the tree of life is revealed after a year-long journey from clay model to three-and-a-half-meter marble. Really magnificent. The way it's catching the light now is spectacular. Very, very beautiful indeed. To start this piece of work as a clay model and see it through in a 40-ton block of marble and to reveal this incredible sculpture is just a, a, a beautiful achievement, you know, technically and conceptually. Oh, thank you. It's a moment to relish. But for Blumenfeld, the greatest satisfaction is the knowledge that tomorrow she'll be back working again in her studio. The wonderful thing about being a sculptor is that you never retire as long as you're able to, as long as you're breathing. And for me, working is breathing. I have a lot more I want to do. <laughs> Thank you.